Hello and welcome back to my beginner's guide for Sid Meier's Civilization for Colonization. In the past three videos I covered getting started in the game, uh, a lot of the early game exploration and stuff, and then some preliminary city development. In this video I'm going to be focusing more on the end game of it. So I've played this game out that I uh, started earlier on in the series. Now this is, on, I'm on the last 100 turns just about, I'm on turn 199, I have 100 more turns to go after this. And this is generally about the time when you should start thinking about starting the revolution. And the revolution is ex essentially how you break away from Europe, your, uh, your fatherland, your motherland, however you would prefer to phrase it, but this is how you gain your independence. And this is... Sometimes one of the hardest parts for new players is to do this correctly, even if you have a budgeting economy, to actually convert that into an, an army that you can field and that will win you battles. So here what we have, this is just before I'm going all in. So right now I'm taking a look at the Revolution Advisor here. Uh, we're going to look at my, I currently have 0% of my people support independence, but that's going to change very soon. Uh, I can't start the revolution until... 50% of my people hit uh, or support independence. Here on my side, we have the colonial forces. As you can see at this turn, turn 199, I have zero warships, zero cannons, zero dragoons, zero soldiers. But I do have 1,250 horses and 1,213 guns, and that will be enough to defeat the Royal Expedition, Expeditionary Force. And keep in mind that this force here is going to grow as I start generating uh, Liberty Bells. So once I start getting this rebel sentiment up, through the generation of Liberty Bells, this force is going to grow because the king will be alarmed at the rebel sentiment. Which is why, as you can see in my cities right here, I am producing political points. I'm doing this so I can get founding fathers that I need without actually increasing the rebel sentiment. So in the very early parts of the game, I did increase my rebel sentiment just a bit because it's more efficient to increase or to produce rebel sentiment in the early game so I can get those couple of early founding fathers. Then I stopped. And when I needed um, political points afterwards to get founding fathers, I did it all through production at, at, by, you, by producing political points using my carpenters. This is because if you produce Liberty Bells over the long stretch of time, like if you produce Liberty Bells over 200 turns, the Royal Expeditionary Force is going to grow much bigger than if you do it in a very short burst. And this is basically because of the total number of bells accumulated. Now, when you're just producing bells every turn and it goes on and on, you generally accumulate more bells than what you need to actually hit that 50% target. So what you want to do is you know, hold off for most of the game producing any of those Liberty Bells and then just before the revolution, I would say 10 turns before it, start producing them in mass. And let's take a look at some of my cities here. Now, when I left you, you might remember I had two cities. I just founded a new one down here. I had founded Fort Orange. And uh, my main city was, of course, New Amsterdam. And as you can see, we have grown. We've spread a bit. Uh, I now have five cities. And I would say, actually, three of these are, they could be eliminated. Yeah. Uh, to, to some extent, maybe not totally. And I'm gonna explain their specialty. So this city down here, Fort Orange, this city specializes in producing coats. So I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna go into the screen. We can get rid of the dry dock and go back to political points. Here we go. And I'm gonna show you some of the improvements. So I have a ma expert trapper on both of my fur resources. That's bringing in plenty of fur. I'm making a total of um, well, 36 plus nine. And I'm also, I have three extra, three, three, can't say that word, can I? Three master fur traders producing coats. And I have a coat factory built in here, which gives me, in addition to the six coats per citizens that, citizen that are working it, uh, an additional 50% for free. So I'm making a total of 54 coats per turn in this city. This city is pretty much specialized for generating coats. And it's important to keep your population low. I, I've seen my, uh, I've seen some people make this mistake and I've made it too, where you try to specialize one city, make one city specialize in everything. And this is generally a detriment because you can only generate so many Liberty Bells per turn. You have a town hall and it can only hold three elder statesmen or three statesmen at max to generate bells. So. You want to keep your population, I'd say keep them below 15, uh, that's ideal. Uh, sometimes, you, uh, definitely below 20 though. 
So what you want to do is each city should specialize. This city specializes in producing coats. That's for orange. If we look here at New Amsterdam, it specializes in producing guns and tools. It, it, goes, it went over 21, so I, I didn't follow my own, own advice there too well. But uh, I also have a couple of master tobaccoists because this is the first city that I was producing cigars in. And... It, I moved that industry out. Right now I produce, this is my main city over here, 12 population, and it is producing cigars. It has the cigar factory, which is like the coat factory. It gives you six per citizen plus 50% extra. So that's a lot of free goods there you're just making out of uh, regular, out of thin air actually. And then my Fort Nassau, or is it Nassau? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the Dutch pronunciations of words. So I'm going to butcher it, but yeah. Just so everybody knows which city I'm talking about here, I'm going to attempt my best to pronounce pronounce it. Can't even pronounce my English. Um, and this city is basically producing ore, and it's supplying um, New Amsterdam with ore every turn, so I can make tools and guns. Uh, this city right here, New Holland, is mostly just producing food at the moment. Uh, they it is producing a little bit of ore, but mostly just food. And I'm shipping a lot of that food over here to New Amsterdam, as you can see. New Amsterdam is sh slowly shrinking. And uh, it's actually it's actually getting too much food, but that doesn't really really doesn't matter. Uh, the small things like that aren't important. Outside of the, both of these cities, I have wagon trains filled with guns and horses, and that's why if you look here at the the total number the total number of weapons I have, it says one thousand two hundred fifty uh, horses and one thousand two hundred thirteen guns. A lot of them are stockpiled here in both of these uh, piles of. Uh, of wagon trains and this is why I can easily move them around this island because when the the English or whatever your civilization is your European motherland whenever they come to attack you they're going to hit the nearest chunk of land most likely so most likely it will be this island here that gets hit the hardest and that's why I have the guns and stuff and wagon trains here so I can move them into cities as needed to turn them into soldiers and dragoons mostly I use dragoons because they are most powerful when fighting uh, like in the open and here is another thing I need to mention. I have most of my, uh, in all these other cities, I have my warehouse completely filled up with guns and horses. That's maximum 300 uh, for warehouse for cities with warehouse expansion. You can see here in New Amsterdam, my first city, I am making 54 guns a turn. That's really quite significant. I've actually gone over the limit that I, that I really should. I'm, I'm making too much, really. And... Uh, in addition to that, uh, my wagon trains, you didn't see my wagon trains earlier. Uh, the, your wagon trains are easily built. Uh, they only cost 40 production points, and they essentially hold, They have well, all of them have two capacity. They can hold two of a good type. So here we can dry two 100 goods into the slots of the, the cargo capacity of the wagon train. And one really interesting thing about them is because this is going to get tedious later on, you're going to want to move goods from city to city. As I pointed out, you're going to want to specialize, which means that a lot of goods are moving around and to have to do that every turn is going to be especially a drag and it consumes a lot of time. So you can automate them. And as you can see here, I have three in the city currently that are automated and I'm going to show you how I set that up. So here we are in the city screen again. And if you go here to the right corner, there are little trade boxes. They show off arrows and it says governor. Click on that. And here you have your imports and exports. Set up your imports. Uh, this means that food that you want to come in, or any goods you want to come into the city and then set up your exports. And this means any of the goods that you want to leave your city. If you set a limit here in the right corner, there's a, there's a box. You can tell how many to retain in the inventory. And then you go and find a wagon train with movement points. You click the assign trade route button, and then you can choose where you want your stuff to move from and where it should move to. And those are all set up by, like I said, if you set up uh, New Holland to export, f to in yeah, to export food and New Amsterdam to import food, and then you click on this button, there will be the option to run that trade route for your wagon trains. And your wagon trains can run multiple trade routes. Don't feel like you have to dedicate one to each, but uh, they can slow. If you assign them too many trade routes, it can slow down their efficiency. So that's where I'm pretty much at at the moment. I don't have any ships, as you saw. I don't really have any soldiers at all. I just have a lot of weapons stockpiled. And I, you know, as you can see here, I did build a fortress around my city of New Amsterdam. And now I'm going to load us for, uh, I think it's seven turns into the future. Here we go. Now, this is seven turns into the future. Let's see some of the things that have changed, as you can see here. Um, my Liberty Bells, this city is making 79 per turn. 
That's my capital or the first city I founded. This one's making 54 per turn. And okay, let's go ahead and break some of this down. Where am I getting all these Liberty Bells from? So to produce Liberty Bells, you need Elder State. Well, you need Statesmen. Elder Statesmen are the most efficient at producing Liberty Bells when assigned to the Statesman position. Uh, I'm getting six from each of these. And if we look at the modifiers, I am also getting 200% from buildings, mostly my newspaper, but they're also like the Cigar Factory adds 25%. The Arsenal adds 25%, the Blacksmith adds 25%, and the University adds 25%. So those buildings do contribute, and that's very important for city, cities that have a lot of population in them. Is If if you're, if you're going for a real big city like me, I went 21, definitely build some of these other buildings that add that percentage to it because you're going to need it. Then we have... 25% uh, from a founding, well, two founding fathers, and then 22% from rebel sentiment. Okay, that's another founding father. And that maybe means we should take a look at founding fathers. As you can see here, I have too many guns in the city, which means that some of them are going to be sold since I have a warehouse expansion. The go goods in here will be sold at 50% of the price they would sell for in Europe, which is nice, better than having them go to waste. But let's take a look at the founding fathers because not all of them are created equal and you only need a few of them. So I did choose the... Um, Pedro, guy who gives you fit, minus 50% travel time to Europe. That was early in the game. I also chose um, Juan de Bermudez, who gives you additional movement points for all of your trade ships, your caravels, your merchantmen, and your galleons. That's very useful. Um, let's keep going here. Uh, that was it for exploration and religion. I don't think I really chose anything. No, I didn't. In trade, though, I chose, of course, Peter Minute who has minus 25% cost of recruiting units in Europe, probably the most vital recruit that I made. I also recruited uh, John Rolf, who gives me additional 25% tobacco in my settlements. That's only because I was focusing on tobacco. If you had focused on some other good type, go ahead and choose that bonus instead. For example, cotton, go ahead and choose Eli Whitney. I also chose Al Alexander Hamilton, which gave me an additional three production per town hall. A very small boost, but it it's okay. And then I also chose John Jacob Astor. Again, this is one that depends on your situation. If you're not producing fur, don't bother with him. And I also chose Cyrus McCormick. Again, if you don't need additional food, you don't need to choose him. But I had enough points, and so I went ahead and did that. If you look over here at military, there are some important ones to get. I did get the looter. This one's not very essential. This uh, guy gives my gunpowder units. Those are not dragoons or just the standard units. The Grenadier 1 promotion, which increases their attack against settlements, I gave... Francis de Coronado, uh, the one plus one movement for Dragoon. This is, I think, is a very good selection. I would definitely try to shoot for that every time because you're going to be mostly using Dragoons, and if your Dragoons have three movement points instead of two, that makes them much more versatile when it comes to covering the map. I also chose um, this Paul Chams de, some French word, and he gives us the formation promotion for gunpowder units. Now, this, again, once again, is not essential because we're not going to be using gunpowder units. We're mostly going to be using mounted Dragoon units. But in case I did find myself in a situation where I needed to fight mounted units with, and such as the Dragoon is a mounted unit, if I needed to fight them with gunpowder units, he would come in handy because he gives us the formation promotion, which increases combat strength against, um, against mounted units. I also, and this guy is actually good too, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette. He increases the gun production rate by, according to the tax rate. Uh, again, not essential. This guy here though, Don Pedro, we are going to be getting him in a few turns and he is absolutely essential because a 50% great general emergence. This is very important for getting promotions such as Surgeon 3, which is critical if you want to heal your units really fast. And I definitely recommend that. As well as Veteran 1 and Minuteman 1 for both mounted units and gunpowder units. So this is definitely the guy who we should be shooting for in the military branch, and I will be getting him shortly as soon as my political points get up to there, which, yeah, as soon as I start a revolution, it should relatively, that should happen pretty quickly because I'll be making a lot of Liberty Bells. Then moving on to the final branch, politics. I chose Pocahontas, really no need to have her. Samuel Adams, definitely recommend him. He increases the uh, Liberty Bell production by the tax rate. Do not choose Benjamin Franklin. He is good, but the problem is he produces bells without your, you really being able to control them. So if you have a printing press or a newspaper built in your city, it's going to produce bells. That's going to increase rebel sentiment, which is going to cause the king to add more units to the expeditionary force. Not something you want. Same with Patrick Henry. He adds three bells per town hall. Don't bother generally. John Jay is a good one because he gives you 
uh, a percentage. It gives you plus 25% Liberty Bell sentiment in your settlements. And this means that you can control it. You know, you decide whether, whether or not you're going to be making any um, any Liberty Bells. He will simply contribute. He will add to it if you decide to. Very good choice. Thomas Paine increases production by tax rate. Again, I, I agree with him. If you're a especially heavy trader like I am, who I have I traded, I think I have like 30,000 gold right now sitting around. Uh, he your your tax rate is going to go up regardless of what civilization you play. And I think towards the end of this game, I was actually at a 30% tax rate. And so as you can imagine, a 30% produce uh, boost to production is quite significant. So I definitely recommend him. Uh, Betsy Ross, meh, you know, three per weaver's house. I mean, you'd be making tons more if you actually just dedicated your units uh, to making cloth. Washington Ivering, once again, same problem. There's Benjamin Franklin and Patrick Henry. You can't control the Liberty Bell generation. And the same thing with uh, Alexis D. something or other. Uh, yeah, the 50% education in all settlements is not particularly useful for me because I do not usually uh, educate many of my units. I, even though I do have a university built, I've only educated maybe five total uh colonists. The rest of them I buy directly from Europe via the purchase button right here, or I get them educated by the Indians or the Native Americans, whichever you prefer, uh, which doesn't really cost me anything. You know, it's free education, so why not? So I'm trying to, I'm trying to think here if there's anything left. As you can see, it's now 95 turns to declare independence. I recommend declaring before turn, uh, on turn 100, no later than that. So I, I sort of beat my goal here because it can take a while to defeat all the king's men. And let's take a look at the revolutionary advisor again. Remember, this is eight turns later. I loaded the game those eight turns later. And as you can see, once again, I have no, um, no colonial forces. I do have a lot more guns. Some of like 300 gun more guns. And the Royal Expeditionary Force has increased a little bit, not too much. And we're not going to try to beat him via the soldiers. We're going to try to beat him just on the ground. So we are pretty much ready to declare our independence. If we take a look here at all the cities, you see next to the little American flag, there's a 45% for my largest city, a 48% support for my Fort Orange city, 100% for New Holland, 56% for the fort, and 56% for this city with name unpronounceable to me. I'm not going to even try. We, you know what I'm talking about. So let's get started, shall we? We simply go to our revolutionary advisor and click start revolution. Yeah, you know, here you get to watch a cutscene of them nailing up the the very pixelated constitution. Is that the right? That's a declaration of independence, actually. And um, the pulling a king down off of a horse. I'm not sure if that has any historical relevance or not. But yeah, look at these movies. You can tell they're really old by just how pixelated they look. It's not the video that I'm recording. It looks this pixelated. Um, the source looks that pixelated. Pretty impressive, actually. Okay. So with the Wonder Movie out of the way, now we get to choose our constitution. And we are presented with some options here, here and I'm going to explain them. Uh, the first one is the stance on slavery. All men are free versus slavery. Generally, the problem here is having two more population per settlement isn't usually needed. Uh, when I'm finished, I usually have the optimal number of population in all my settlements. I don't need any more. If I need to recruit uh, military units, I simply use the ones that are currently in my settlements. Therefore, having a 50% bonus to all of these usually sounds pretty good. So yeah, I mean, go ahead. Um, yeah, actually chose slavery for my constitution there. What do you know? Well, well, actually, that makes sense because if you think about the American constitution, when they, when the when the American government seceded from uh, England, uh, they actually did have slavery yet. So I guess it is historically relevant. Uh, please choose your stance on elections. You can either can choose monarchy, continue trade with Europe, or elections. For me, monarchy is a must because I currently have all but one of the founding fathers that I need. Please choose your stance on natives for your new constitution. Since I have not had any problems with natives in this game, I'm going to choose native rights. They haven't been bothered me, and I'd like to leave them alone for the most part. However, if you've been having problems with natives here, you have Manifest Destiny, which will give you 50% bonus when fighting them. So... 
you know, that one's pretty much up to your, your personal situation. Here we have your stance on religion. Either separation of church and state converts immigration cross into bells or a theocracy converts immigration cross into production. Since I don't focus much on producing crosses at all, uh, this one doesn't have much relevance to my play style, but I'm going to choose to create it uh, to convert. There we go. Convert crosses into bells because I could use more rebel sentiment. And then here we have your stance on land security, plus one for colonists. Now it should be noted that this is just plus one strength for an unarmed colonist. So in other words, the type you see walking around your land. In general, controlled arms is much better because the, the odds of your unarmed colonist just walking around who isn't a soldier fighting and winning, very, very low. So that takes care of forming our constitution, and really all we have left to do is wait until the king's men get here. Now, since I'm just going to speed along to this, I'm not going to actually do any of my usual economic busy tasks because it takes a considerable amount of the time I spend playing the game, although I would like you to note I currently have 27,000 gold in the bank. So as you can see, I didn't need to be playing at the lowest difficulty level. I probably could have easily played at regular difficulty and still won this. I wasn't aware I was this good at the game uh, before I actually picked it up and started playing it again. Okay, our f uh, last founding father has um, finally asked to join our cause, and yes, we're going to accept him. We're just going to ignore the European trade screen for now. I'm just going to keep advancing turns until the king's men get here. Ah, here the king's men are. So, as you can see, they rolled up in ships and they all landed on my island. And I just got some new colonists in each of these cities from the abundance of food. And this is how I'm going to turn, this is how I'm going to start fighting. Because if we look here back at the revolution advisor, you can see I don't have any soldiers and I don't have any dragoons right now. I have nothing in terms of a military. So you're, you're thinking, how do you fight all these? Well, it's quite simple. In each of my cities, like I pointed out before, I have both guns and horses, and that's what is required to build a Dragoon. Each Dragoon unit, which is a mounted unit, requires 50 guns and 50 horses to build. And so when you click, when you take any unit and you put them into your, so for example, in your garrison, here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to drag uh, my fisherman into the garrison, and here we have the option, turn him into a Dragoon outside settlement. We're going to drag another fisherman, Dragoon outside settlement, uh, take the woodcutter, Dragoon outside settlement, take the master carpenter, same thing. And this is how we're making an army. I'm just going to keep doing that until I have a sizable army. And then I'm also going to turn my free colonist into a Dragoon as well. So here we have a stack of Dragoons. And as you can see, they have the uh, veteran one, 10% strength uh, promotion already, simply because I have, uh, let's go back to military. I have Dom Pedro right here as one of my founding fathers. I accepted him just this turn. It was just last turn, I think. And let's take a look at some of the odds. Now, the the king's men do not receive any bonus from being in the forest. So the, despite the fact that this defense, this tundra here has a forest on it and it says 50% defensive bonus, none of their units are actually going to receive that. So you don't have to worry about fighting them on open terrain just as long as you fight them outside your city. If you fight them in your city, you're going to lose because they have artillery, which has 125% settlement attack. And they'll bombard your defenses down relatively quickly because they have ships that can do it and the artillery bombard as well. So here's what we want to do. We want to attack outside the settlement. And if you take a look at the odds here, right away off the bat, I have 87.8% 80, odds of winning and a 3.7% chance of retreating. So the strength is 440 on my side versus 315 on their side. I'm getting 10% strength from that promotion. And I'm getting an additional 15% strength from my rebel sentiment. And that is something else I should touch on here is that your rebel sentiment is um, cut in half. And then that is added to your overall combat strength. So in other words, if you have 50%, well, the more the more rebel sentiment actually might be a little bit lower than that. But anyway, you get some, for, you get a certain percentage from your rebel sentiment. The higher your rebel sentiment is, the greater percentage uh, strength boost you have against the king's men. So here we are, we're gonna try it. And here we go, simple battle, just like that. That's how battles work in Civilization 4 Colonization, much like Civilization 4 if you have played it. And as you can see, we won that one, and we just pretty much rinse and repeat. We just do that until we have beaten all the units that are on the map, and then the king, he will take his ships, go back to Europe, and he will get some more. So in other words, you, you don't have to fight his entire expedition expeditionary force. As you can see, he has 21 regulars, 8 dragoons, um, 13 artillery, and 4 warships. You don't have to fight all of those right away because he can't carry them all in his ships right away. 
they're going to be coming in waves. And then you can usually deal with that. So even when going up against uh, one of the King's Dragoons, we still have a 65.2% odds of winning. But I died, you know, that will happen. You will lose units, but it gets better, generally speaking. And that really does pretty much do it. So if I need more Dragoons than I have guns and horses for, I simply move these wagon trains, move them all back in, and I have access to a ton more of weapons. And uh, so basically, your the population in your cities become your soldiers. I'm going to be dragging my carpenters here to create Dragoons. I'm going to be dragging my blacksmith down to, be, to become dra Dragoons. And they all can become Dragoons. It's that simple. And then they will attack, and you'll defeat the king's men. Is that really that simple? Um, as long as you have enough munitions laying around, such as guns and horses, uh, you're going to do well. And remember, you don't have to produce all of it. Like, I have 30,000 gold right here. I could go to Europe, and I could buy a ton of guns and a ton of horses. So I, I could have actually declared independence quite a few turns earlier, but I didn't. And that is really up for you to decide when to you, you are ready to declare independence. And... At my, I think at my knowledge level of the game, I could easily play a much higher difficulty level. This was not much of a challenge at all. It, overall, the game took me about 12 hours to beat. Uh, if you want me, I'll load up the, the final save. This is after I beat all the king's men. Uh, as you can see, you get a message, Raising Hell wins by Independence Victory. And this is basically how the end game looked. As you can see here, I did buy some frigates. That's what I used most of my money for. I bought some frigates, and I actually attacked some of the king's ships. But um, I defeat, also defeated most of his units. If we look here, he had five artillery, two dragoons, and nine regulars left when I defeated all of his ships. And if you defeat all his ships, that's an alternative you will win via that instead because you can't get them to the new world anymore. However, it should be noted that you really can't reliably count on that to always be the case because the number of ships he has varies by the game. Uh, the units themselves are randomly generated, so it will vary from game to game what the composition of the forest you will be facing is. However, as you can see, I didn't lose a single city here during this um, this revolution. Not, not a single one of my cities were captured. I have tons of units. And as I pointed out, there should be a great general right here he is. You can see the great general is walking along with the horse. I'm going to turn off the resources there so you can see him a little bit better. Uh, he is important because he allows you to get the third medic promotion, which will allow your units to heal significantly faster. I think it heals 15% damage per turn. It's quite significant and that is one of the reasons why you want to get great generals. How you use great generals, do not com you combine them with a unit on a tile. Let me see if I have another great general sitting around in here. Here you go. So here's a great general. Move him onto a tile by himself. Move another unit onto the same tile as him. And then apply the great general by clicking the lead troops. Now, if you lead a whole bunch of troops, your troops will not get much experience because the experience that he provides will be divided out through them all. So you would generally want to isolate him and another unit on a single tile and then lead them. And that unit will get a significant boost in terms of experience as well as have access to some promotions he otherwise wouldn't, such as the leadership, which gains you 100% experience from combat. And of course, Surgeon 3, which, you know, normal units can get Surgeon 2, but uh, units that are led by a great general can get surge in three. So I think that pretty much covers everything. Uh, I think this gives you a pretty sound uh, foundation on how to begin your game and what to sort of expect come time to declare independence in Civilization IV Colonization. This is definitely one of my favorite spinoffs of the Civilization franchise. I think it is really quite compelling how they turned it into a game that was focused very much on uh, economy, such as building up my cities here. As you can see, I have a lot of buildings improved in there, and it takes time to do that, and it's fun, and I also have improved my land a little bit, but you don't have to take over the entire world. I mean, that's not what the game is about, and overall, um, it's a nice distraction from Civilization IV at times when you get sick of it. So thank you very much for watching. If you have any additional questions or something I didn't cover, feel free to ask me in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to answer them. And of course, I hope to see you next time.